worthy this morning. Starts changing. Oh, I'm gonna worship till I mean every word. Cause the way I feel and the fear I'm facing doesn't change who you are or what you deserve. Come on.
remember where he brought you from this morning. He brought us all from the grave to life. And I was a rich, I remember who I was. I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated, the bridge was far too wide. But from the far side of So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe, broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time.
Today, I want to expand a little more. Last week, I know I do Christmas services or sermons, sometimes kind of weird compared to everybody else. You know, I'm not doing nativity. Even though we talked about some of the wise men, we talked about some of the shepherds, I, I really attacked this from, as God began to deal with me, a king is coming. And last week, we really began the process of understanding a king coming and, and who he was and how that kingdom works. And we started through operating through that. So today, I want to expand on it a little bit more. Not that he was just not a king of this world, not how the kingdom works. We, we talked about the main thrust is that if he was lifted up, he would drag all men. The word draw there is Klelko, and it literally means to drag, to forcibly drag. So Jesus says, if, if I fulfill what I'm supposed to fulfill, if I come and do what I'm supposed to do, if, if the world does what it's supposed to do and crucifies me and everything goes to plan, then something will change. Something will change in this world, and then I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men to myself. He will become the king of this world. Well, we know that that happened. 2,000 years later, we are still proclaiming his name. We are still waiting for our king to return. And so today I want to expand on that a little bit more. Go with me to Matthew 13, Matthew 13, verse 51 and 52. So part two, a king is coming. Let's jump into this and let's look at it even at a larger scale. Here's what the Bible says. And Jesus said to them, have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes, Lord. Yes, we have. And he said unto them, therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the what? So every person, every, every, every teacher, every person who is, who is called a legitimate person of knowledge a person of wisdom, if we break this down, he said to them, every person of wisdom or every person that lives by wisdom, every person that lives by knowledge, who is a teacher, who is a learner, does what? Every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a household who brings out his treasure, his treasure things, new and so what he said was, he said, every person who is a learner, every person who is, who is growing, who has become a disciple of the kingdom, when they are growing and learning this, something happens in them. They don't just become citizens of the kingdom, they become actually knowledgeful of the kingdom. And the knowledge of the kingdom all of a sudden becomes treasures that they bring out at any time some things old, some things new, but they're constantly bringing things out. So when people ask me many times, they're like, Pastor, you and, and Brother Rouse, I, I still miss him a lot. He's, he, when he passed away, it's, it, he would say that, he said, you could take two words and go, but that's not Tim Lott. You have to understand, that's what the kingdom does. That if you choose to be a learner, if I, if I run into a pastor who's still preaching the same thing he preached 42 years ago, I'm depressed. It's because, listen to me, if you are a learner, a scribe, a teacher, and you become a disciple of the kingdom, he said, here's the thing that's going to happen. You are going to inherit treasures new and old, and you're going to, at any moment of your life that's needed, bring them out. And you're going to be able to minister to people, to care for people, to, to as, as quoted sometimes, you know how to say the right thing at the right time. No, God knows how to say the right thing at the right time. But like Paul told Timothy, study to show yourself approved. A workman that can rightly divide the word of God. Study to show yourself as someone who is taking in knowledge, taking in information, and God will at the right time allow it to come out as treasures. Some things, well, I've heard that before. Yeah, but it's still true. And some things new. Well, I've never heard that before. Well, that's just a new way of looking at something that you've seen. And he says, listen to me. This is what the kingdom is about. This is what the kingdom 
does. Jesus is trying desperately to share with them the understanding of his kingdom. While he was on earth, he wanted to let them know, this is what my kingdom looks like. Now, in Matthew 13, he's going to share this all through the chapter. In verse 24, he talks about the kingdom being like weeds that is sown into a garden. Here's what it says. Another parable he put to them saying, the kingdom of heaven, look at the person beside you and say, the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is the king of, he's the Lord of, he reigns and rules. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who took good seed to his field. And what he said was, he said, this man sowed good seed. He sowed seed, that's us. That's the word. He said, this man went into the world and he sowed good things. He said, but the enemy, the devil also said, well, I'm going to stop him. So how does he say, I'm going to stop him? He said, I'm going to go back at night and I'm going to sow bad seed. I'm going to sow just a bunch of grass. I'm going to sow stuff that you can't eat. I'm going to sow stuff that's no good. And they started watching it come up and the people said, what, did you sow good seed or, or what is the deal? And the master says, no. An enemy has come and sown behind me. Well, what are we going to do? He says, let them grow together. So let me go ahead and help you out. Every time you keep praying, Lord, I wish you would move so-and-so out of my office because they're driving me crazy. Every time you, 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 you pray, Lord, I wish my husband would just go ahead and just meet you and go on to meet you in the heavens and, because I'm telling you, God, we'll both be happier. He'd be happier going home and I'll be happy being at home. Every time you pray this, understand God is laughing at you. God is laughing at you because he said, in the world, I'm sowing good seed and the enemy's sowing what? And it's going to come up together. You're going to have to learn to grow together. He said, but understand that in due time, when it's time to harvest, then I'll send my pickers, I'll send my angels, I'll send those, and I'll tell them to gather all the grass and bundle it up, throw it into the fire. And he said, then the wheat, golden wheat, I'll have it bundled up and carry it to my barns. He said, don't worry about it. It's not frustrating me. It's not slowing my plan down. It's not preventing me from accomplishing what I want to accomplish. If you go to verse 31, he talks about a mustard seed. Here's what he says in verse 31. Another parable he put to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in a... He said it looks small, it's really insignificant. He said he went into this big old field and, and, and it seems like, Lord, what's one little bitty seed? Because that thing's you can barely see it. What's one little seed going to do in the midst of all of this big old field? He said, but it's like a mustard seed that a master took and he pushed it in the ground right in the middle of a field. And you say, well, it's insignificant. It's too little. No, he said, but when it sprouts, that little seed becomes a big tree. And he said, birds nest in that tree. And he said, when you walk in that field, you won't help but be able to say, hey, look, there's a mustard tree. It'll, it'll, it'll rise above all the other things. It'll rise above. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like that. He said, let me show you what the kingdom of heaven, verse 33. He said, it's like a woman who took leaven and she had leaven and, and, and she went to the, to the bread and she tore three different spots. The Bible says in different areas, she, she tore it open and put a little leaven there. And then she opened the meal up over there and put a little leaven and put a little leaven and she bundled put it all together and you're thinking that's a big old piece of dough and you just put a little pinch of leaven in it and he said she just put it up and came back later and guess what the whole loaf was leavened he said the kingdom of God is like that see we live that and it's easier for us because we were that little church in the middle of Jones and Bank Street we were that little church that had five or 10 people or whatever we had at different times and two on Wednesday night. And people's like, Lord, that poor little old place that needs to just close. Ain't somebody just needs to close the doors. In fact, before I came, that was the, that was the plan. Close the doors. 
that we'd went through six pastors in six years and the little church was cracking down the middle and, and it, was, it was like, just close the door. But God said, if I can just take a mustard seed, if, if, it, if you have the faith of a mustard, if, if you just take something that's real in the kingdom, we think it's got to be something big. No, no, just a little something in the kingdom. And if it's added to anything in this world, the world can't, can't control it. In fact, it will overwhelm the world. That's what the world's frustrated about right now. We want to take Jesus out of school. We want to take Jesus out of prayer in the school. We don't want to pray at baseball games and football games. We don't want to mention his name. We don't want him talked about. We don't want, and, and you know what? We keep thinking that we're going to remove the kingdom by simply trying in our power to do it. He says, listen, the kingdom is like a little bit of leaven. The kingdom is just a little bit of something. But when it's added, it doesn't matter if it's a big old field. It's going to overwhelm the big old field. It's going to be noticed. In verse 44, listen how he says it. He said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for the joy of it, he goes and sells all that he has. And see, the first person that does this is Jesus. The first person that does this is, is our Lord. He comes into a lost world. He comes into a world that is that is. Just, just destroyed. In fact, God almost did. But Jesus says, my father found good. He found a treasure. Look at the person beside you and say, he found you. He found you in the middle of all of this chaos, in the middle of all this world, in the, ma in the middle of people getting shot at quick stops and, and, and all the... the uh, different illegal stuff that goes on and all the chaotic stuff that goes on and all the, in the middle of all of that, God found you. And here's what God said. God had said, I walked and looked through the world and I found treasure. So what did I do? I went and sold everything that I had. Well, what did I have? What was the most precious thing? My son. I went and sold my son and paid him as a price to buy the field. Now, if I buy the whole field, guess what I also get comes with it? The treasure. That's why the man says that when he dug it up and he found a treasure, what did he do? He went and buried it again in the field. He said, I, I can't remove it. It would be stealing. If I remove the treasure from the field, it's stealing. So I can't do that. I cover it back up and I go away and I find out who owns the field. And I say, how much will it take to buy this field? I want to buy that field. You want that field? Yes, I want that field. And, 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 and I want the mineral rights and I want the water rights and I want the rights to anything that's in that field, anything built on that field before I buy it. If there's a shed on that field, I want it all transferred to me. And he said, well, here's the price. And the man says, oh, that's a lot. I'll have to sell everything I got to buy that. Well, if you want it, that's what it cost. That's what Satan did. Satan said, you want it? That's what it cost. A life for a life. First man, Adam, had to die. I bought it. You'll take a second man, Adam, to rebuy it. And God said, for so... I love the world that I gave my only begotten son that whosoever would believe in me would not perish but have everlasting life. Do you understand what Jesus is teaching? He said, my father bought the field. Go with me to verse 45. I'll show it to you again. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking a beautiful pearls. He, he is in the business of finding pearls. What was God in the business of? Finding worshipers. He said, I want to find something that will worship. I know I created all these other things. I created all these angelic beings, and they're, they're created to worship me, but I want something to choose to worship me. I want a pearl that like, is, is unlike any other pearl. Do you understand that's why the book of Job is written? I know we get caught up in, in his children dying and this, that, but the whole purpose of the book of Job is that God found a pearl. 
God would look at Satan and say, have you considered my servant Job? Don't he shine good? Isn't he pretty? I've been in the business of looking for pearls and I found one. Check out Job. And Satan, of course, tells him, if you did this and this, he won't shine for you. He said, I believe he will. I believe he's a genuine pearl. I believe he's the real McCoy. And Jesus says, let me show it to you in a story. He says, my father is a collector of precious pearls. Look at the person beside you and say, do you know how precious you are? Do you know how valuable? Look at the other person. Look, tell them. Do you know how valuable you are? Now smile real big and say, God does. God knows how valuable you are. God knows how, how precious you are. God knows your value. Jesus says, it's like a man who, who he was in the business of finding pearls. And guess what? When he went in the shopping center one time, there was a pearl. I mean, it was, I don't know what kind of oyster laid this pearl. I don't know what kind of clam laid this pearl, but I'm telling you, whatever laid this pearl, it was, it was the bomb. It was a pearl. And he said, I went and sold every pearl that I had. I went and sold all the other little pearls, every little pearl I ever possessed. I sold them all to pr- purchase this one precious pearl. He said, that's what God did. That is the kingdom of God. That is the kingdom of God. Go with me to verse 47. One more. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet. Oh, there's that word again. Dragging. If I be lifted up, I will drag all men unto myself. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind. So when you're on this world and you're frustrated by all that goes on and you're growing right next to weeds and, and, and look at yourself like a fish and you're like this, I'm this, I'm this nice fish, this, this, this trout. I'm, I, mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm beautiful. I got all these beautiful colors. I got a, but right beside me is this yellow catfish that had been living on the bottom and he'd been eating the garbage on the bottom. And, and man, he, his meat ain't no good anymore. He's so old and yellowy. Anybody ever catch catfish? Like You don't want to catch them when they're too old. and You, you skin them and it's just yellow. You're like, Lord, what has that thing been eating? He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who throws a net in and he catches all kinds of fish, some clean, some unclean, some good, some not good. He says, what do you think will happen? He said, well, at that day, my angels will pull out the bad ones and they'll throw them up on the bank. Now, don't tell Peter this, but me and my brothers, we used to have a lot of fun with that. If we ever caught mud cats, we don't like mud cats, then they'll pop if you jump on them. Anybody ever, when they were a kid, some of y'all didn't have as disadvantaged a life as I did. We made toys out of whatever we had. Sometimes it was a mud cat. You could take that mud cat, you could sit in there, and, and my little brother Terrence, he couldn't stand it, man. He's like, no, don't do that. He see, it just, it just tore him up. And me and Trent, we would be smiling. Yes, Trent, leading praise and all that. He, 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 he's singing about the Lord and how, how much he, and it, he'd be the first one. And you'd land on that thing, I think, go, poof. The air pocket inside would a pop. Because the guy done told us where we were fishing. Look, don't throw none of them mud cats back in there. Now they just destroyed my pond. Just get rid of them. And if you catch these or these, you throw And we would, man. We, we'd kill something, throw it on an ant bed. We wouldn't throw it on a lie. We'd kill a little fish and throw it on and watch the ants eat it. And just, you say, oh, that's horrible. Thought, but God wants you to realize, listen to me. The people, the people who have given this world the most junk, And the people who have brought the most chaos into this world. Let me tell you what God says is going to happen. Don't you worry about them. There's coming a day I'm going to drag them up on the bank. And I'm going to take what the world thought was something good. And I said, that's just junk. And I'm going to take it and I'm going to throw it up in the the front of the sunshine up on the bank. And I'm going to let it flop and I'm going to let it do whatever until it dries up and dies. It's not going back in the water anymore. You understand? Now, for you that want to live that way, just know that's what's coming. There's a day when they're going to drag the net, and if you don't fit the fish, if you don't fit 
the wheat. If you're just a weed, you're going to go into the fire. If you're just a bad fish, you're going to get thrown up on the bank. And he's trying to give them a picture of what the king, the kingdom takes care of itself. You don't have to worry about the kingdom. You don't have to protect the kingdom. You don't have to worry the kingdoms. The kingdom's been built to take care of you. So he says, this is, this is it. So now go back with me to verse 51 and 52. Chapter 13, I just read this to begin, but now since I've taught a little bit more because remember what the scripture says, Jesus said to them, have you understood all these? Now look at that person beside you and ask him, do you understand what you just heard? Do you understand what you just heard? I, all I did was teach you exactly what Jesus just taught them. And he looks at them and says, do you understand what I just said? Well, I don't know. No, 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 no. I don't, I don't need your stupid. I don't need your input. I need to know, did you hear what I just said? Yes or no? Well, I don't, li- I don't care if you like it or not. That's not what I'm asking. Do you understand what I just said? Do you understand how it's going to end? Do you understand the way the world, the kingdom of God works? Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes, Lord. I mean, they, they understood fishing. They understood wheat and grass and they burnt fields. and they, We understand it. Yeah, we get the picture. Then he said to them, therefore, every scribe Every person that thinks he knows something. Every person that thinks he knows something but will become a learner of the kingdom. That will become a disciple of the kingdom. Of heaven is like a householder. It means you possess something, you own something now that the world and others can't possess. I own it And what I own does this, like a householder who brings out his treasured things, new and old. When I understand what he's talking about the kingdom, then what it allows me to do is grow and adjust my life to the kingdom way. And as I adjust my life to the kingdom way, I become someone who now can impact the world more and more like that mustard seed that grows and becomes a bush and then becomes a tree and then birds start. Why? Because I've become one now one of the strongest in the field. Because my wisdom is past the wisdom of this world. Let me show it to you a little more. Go with me to Philippians 2. Verses 1 through 11. Let's see if the Apostle Paul can show it to you a little better. Is this all right? Okay. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. He said, he said, if you will become kingdom-minded and you will understand this and, and will, will, will fall in love with this, then it will bring me the greatest joy. Having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. The reason the church cannot impact the world right now is because we have 47 different theologies, about 47 different scriptures, and we can't come together and settle on the fact of exactly what it says. And because we're in disjunction, then the world will not listen to it. They'll just pick and choose whatever they like, and, and just like we do. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each one of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. How can I do this? It's not not, not the world's way. I've got to take care of myself. I've got to... 
Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but for the others. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. So Jesus has a kingdom mindset, and he says, I need you to have it. Jesus had a kingdom mindset, and I need you to get it. I'm not asking you to do something that has not been done. I'm asking you to do something that's already been done. And here's what he says. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So he's, he says, in the beginning of this, I was right there on the same level with the Father. I'm, I'm sitting in the throne. I had it. I didn't have no, there wasn't no quarrels between us. No problem. Who being in the form of God, considered not liable to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation. So start writing this down if you want to. How do I move into the kingdom? How do I move to where God wants me to be? Number one, quit worrying about your reputation and what others are going to think about you and what others are going to say about you. Just do what the kingdom says do. Quit worrying about how you're going to build a reputation. And you say, well, that, that, is that easy? No. No, because all the way along the way, you're going to have this one thought all the time. Nobody even knows what all I do. Nobody even cares about what all I do. Nobody even, I mean, people don't know how many bathrooms I have to clean around here and how much stuff I have to do. And, 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 and people have no idea that when we get finished many times, I, I go behind and check all the d- different dorms and all the different rooms and air conditioners are left on, lights are left on, people come play basketball and don't turn the stuff back off. People don't know. It's not important. Don't worry about your reputation. Just do what you're supposed to do. Jesus did that. Jesus said, I came and I just did what I was supposed to do. I I served what the Father told me to serve. Having the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of so usually when I'm coming to people, I'm in blue jeans or I've, I, don't, I don't, you know, if you catch me on a Monday or Tuesday, I definitely don't look like a pastor lot if I'm up here working and doing things. But listen to me, God don't care. God don't care. The funniest times I ever have is when I'm dressed like that, working and covered in stuff and my hair is all over and I'm going to do it. And I walk up and, and, and somebody says, well, who are you? And I said, well, I'm Tim Lott. And, and they're like, you're Pastor Lott. I'm like, oh, so you don't care about my clothes now. You've heard of me. You know me. See, your reputation is not built off what you keep adding to it or what you keep doing. It's what God has put in the hearts of others. That's your reputation. Not what you try to create. Not the photos you try to put on Instagram. It's what others already think about you and know about you. He said he made of himself no reputation. If you'd asked Jesus, who are you? Well, I'm a carpenter. I was lived in Galilee and Nazareth, and, and in fact, it was the poorest area, and one of my own disciples asked the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's where I come from. I have no reputation, nothing. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. He said, I came. In fact, the Old Testament said he had nothing about him that was, that was beautiful. I think Jesus was chubby. I think Jesus was short, chubby, and Kind of balding. You can believe what you want to. But the Bible says he had nothing about him that men would go to. God made him whatever I believe Joseph or those around him looked like, I believe that's what he looked like. He didn't have blue eyes, long, flowing, beautiful hair. In fact, the night of Gethsemane, just to show you that I'm telling you the truth, the night of Gethsemane, the soldiers asked Judas, they said, give us a sign to let us know which one he is. And Judas says, the one that I kiss, that's him. So do you think they could tell the difference? Peter was probably better looking than him. Peter's like, I'm better looking than you. I'm, I'm, I'm bigger than you, bolder than you. How come you get to be? I'm the Lord. Sorry, that's just the way it is. 
but he made himself no reputation. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. So he, no reputation, humbled himself and became obedient. That's all the kingdom asks. He who will find his life will, and he who's willing to lose his life for the kingdom's sake will find it. Therefore, God, oh, so since he did this, something happens. Something happens in the kingdom when you do this. Something takes place in the kingdom. In fact, the disciples asked Jesus, we want to be great in the kingdom. He said, to be great in the kingdom, you must be the servant of all. The greatest in the kingdom are the ones who are the greatest servants. The lowest ones are the ones that's made the highest. The ones who, who bring themselves the lowliest, the ones who ask for the least, the people who are willing to serve without worrying about being served, those are the people that I raise up. Therefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those things in heaven, of things on earth, and those things under the earth. Now get this now. Go back to that scripture. This is very important because I'm going to show it to you. That the name of Jesus, what, what's, the, what's the phrase? Every, every knee shall bow of those in and those and those I want you to remember that. This is very important. Verse 11. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. This is the whole purpose of the kingdom. The purpose of the kingdom is that I am invited in. And when I'm invited in, it's not on my credit. It's not on my my, what I bring. It's not my talent. It's the fact that I am willing to enter into the kingdom and I'm willing to be lowly. I'm willing to be obedient. I'm willing to be submissive. I'm willing to allow him to be Lord of my life and me not to Lord over anything. I'm willing to do that. And he says, if you can do that, Tim, the better you can do that, the higher I will lift you up in the kingdom. Just as I did my son, I will do it. For you. Now go with me to Revelations 5, 1 through 14. I preached all that to get you here. I want to show you the picture of it now. Jesus showed you what it looked like when he was on earth trying to tell them about fields, and Paul told them what it would look like. In the bigger picture, how Jesus was willing and, and, and what Jesus was doing and giving them a picture. But now I want to show you the fullness of it. Look at the person beside you and say, a king is coming. A king is coming. When we talk about his birth, when we're talking about him coming onto the scene, a king is coming. Here's what it says. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and out and the back, sealed with seven seals. Now, I'm going to walk through this, and I'm going to go through as much as I can, as fast as I can. What he's talking about is he's just showed you this chapter before the power of God, the throne of God, that that angelic creatures are are praising him. It is a powerful scene. Everything is is, is powerful. And he says, what I've showed you is is the power and the authority of God. But now what I'm fixing to show you is the authority of his servant, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's what he says. I saw sitting on the throne the Father. And I wish I had a chair. I'll get one. He said, what I saw was the Father. He was sitting on his throne. Sitting represents the fact that I, I'm over everything. Remember I told you that God had authority over everything. Last week we talked about it. God had authority, but he did not have what? Domain. We had domain and God had to purchase that back. That's what we just taught. So he has authority. God could wipe out everything and say I'm through with it because he has full authority. But he also has a plan. Anybody ever have questions you always wondered what what happened there or why that didn't happen or you would like to know the answer to things that that just, can I tell you something? God has that, but he has it in his hand. 
The Bible says that God says, I know the plans that I have for you. I know them. You don't know them. Nobody. Jesus was once asked, well, when are you coming back? He says, I can't tell you when I'm coming back. Those things are in the Father's. Okay, you need to understand it. I ain't got time to go through all of those scriptures, but does that give you an understanding? They are in God's hand. So John said, what I saw was in God's hand, a scroll. Now, I want you to realize that the book of Acts, the book of Acts, if it was a scroll, everything was written as a scroll, parchment and rolled up. Do you know that if you would pull out the book of Acts and would have stretched it out, it would be almost 14 feet long on parchment? It would have been almost 14 feet long. He says, in his hand, I saw the parchment. I saw the papers. And I saw in the right hand, him who sat, and I put mine on my left. I did it wrong. I'm left-handed. See, I'm not, not as godly as I need to be. In his right hand, on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the... Usually they only written, they only wrote it on one side. That just wrote it on one. God said, I've got so much and so much information and so many things detailed and so much that I had to write everything that I have planned for the world and everything that I have planned out. I have to write it on a scroll and I have to write it on both sides. That's how detailed God is. Everything you ever wanted to know, all the answers, all the mysteries, God says, I hold them in my hand. And I saw him proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll? So we've reached a point and we've got to get this out. We've got to get to the end of this. We've got to get to the end of what God wants to do in the world. How are we going to get there? And here's what has happened. And I saw a strong, verse two, and verse, go back to verse two. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals? And there are seven seals Upon this scroll, seven seals. Seven is perfection. You'll hear that word several times through what I'm fixing to read. There are seven seals. These seven seals represents the perfection of what God is going to do. Nothing can stop it. Nothing can change it. Every I will be dotted. Every T will be crossed. There is not one diddle, not one thing that will go undone. Whatever's written on that scroll, if it can be opened, will be fulfilled. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming, who is worthy to open it? Verse 3, and, one, and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll and to look at it. In other words, if I have hope in this world only and this is as far as we can go and there is nothing else, I am man most miserable. That's what Paul said. If I have hope in this world and what's happening is, he says, in this, in this world, everything's stuck where it is. There's a, there's a thing that God wants to do, but nobody can open it. There's a finish line that God has, but nobody can reach it. You can't get to the, to the field. You can't get on it. And God says, I'm stuck and I need to fix it. So I wept much because no one found worthy to open to read the scroll or I, or I took at, or I look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose the seven seals. And I looked and behold, I saw a lion, Right? The elder says, look, there is a lion of the tribe of Judah who is able to open it. But when John says, I turned and looked in the midst of the throne, so if you want to know where Jesus is right now, if you want to know where he's at right at this moment, God is sitting on his throne and there in the throne room on the same level is Jesus. He is making intercession for you and me. He's our mediator. He is, his blood is what sits before the throne of God. He is the one that God looks at day and night and says, I, for the love that I have for you, I forgive this. And for the love I have for you, I will, I will move here and I will do this. For all the things that we pray for come by Christ Jesus. For my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches by Christ 
Oh, man, there's so much here I could preach and, and teach, but is it okay? I'm just messing you up, right? Okay. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. I believe with all my heart, when I see Jesus for the first time, I will not see him with white hair and glowing and his feet like... I believe with all of my heart that when I see Jesus the very first time, I will see him in his lowliness. I believe we cannot understand his glory without appreciating his lowliness. And John said, I'm looking for a lion. And he said, well, there he is. He's dressed like a lamb. But don't be mistaken, he's a lion. He's a king from the tribe of Judah, from the seed of David. He is a king. But he doesn't enter in as a king. He doesn't have to. If you know who you are, you don't need anybody to give you an entourage. And there stood a lamb as though he had been slain, having seven horns. Seven represents perfection, perfect in power. And he had seven perfect in vision. He sees all, he reigns over all. There is no power, no authority, nothing greater than him. That's what he's saying. When I saw him, he had seven horns, he had seven eyes, and it had been slain, and the seven eyes, who are the seven spirits of God, sent into all the world. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him. Jesus walks up to the Father. He says, I'll take that, Dad. And for the first time, what God has held in his hands from the beginning of time, from the counsel of God before time ever existed, Jesus takes out of his hands now. Can you imagine the day when Jesus finally looks over at the Father and says, I'm ready. The father says, son, it's time. It's time. And the son grabs hold of that. Well, I'm going to show you what it looks like. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now, when he had taken the scroll from the, the four and the living creatures and the 20 and four elders fell down before the, each having harp, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people. And he says, listen to me, I wanna show you the picture. Remember what we read in Philippians? I told you to remember it. That at the name of Jesus, every, everything in heaven, everything in earth, everything under the earth will give him glory and will give him praise. Can I tell you something, people? What we're doing and going through in this kingdom, we are growing up with grass. We are like fish that are swimming around with the catfish and the mud cats. And we're thinking, why in the world is it this way? But can I tell you just for a moment that the plans of God have not been released fully yet? That the plans of God have not been truly let go yet? But there's coming a time when our champion, our king, will look over at the Father, the King of glory, and will say, hey, I'm ready. And the Father will say, it's time. And he will take that. And when he does, the things that have been set wrong will be made right. We 
look at it as the seals and we look at it as the tribulation period, but what God sees it as, as my son putting everything right that once was wrong. It's the answer to all the prayers of incense that's in those bowls, all the prayers through the years of people who were martyred, of people who died on, on a different situation, people who were killed and imprisoned, people who gave their life preaching the gospel. Every one of them, he said, listen to me, all of their prayers is like a smell that comes up before my nostrils and I've been smelling it as the elders held it before me but finally my son is fixing to let go and let loose and fix the things that have been made wrong all these years. And they sang a new song saying you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals for you were slain and you have redeemed us Notice now from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. This is not Jews. This is his body. This is his bride. And have made us and have made us kings and what? Look at the person beside you and tell them, do you understand that you are a kingdom of priests? Go ahead and smile at them and just tell them, say, do you know that you have king in you? See, God already knows it. He just wants to know, can you hold out until it's revealed? Can you hold out until everything that I have and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall, oh Lord, when people are worried about Russia and China, and who's going to do what, and can I just tell you, I know how it ends. I don't know what part of the world, I don't know where, but I'm a governor somewhere. <laughs> governor Tim Lott. God says, I'm taking that away from that dipstick and I'm giving it to you. Now you reign because you're my priest. Because you were my ambassador when you didn't know it. When people didn't know who you were, now they will know who you are. See, we live that on small scales down here. Tim, nobody used to know who you are, but now, and Tim used to be, but now, and Tim... But don't worry, God says, when I let this go, I'm going to take it up a notch. It's not just going to be in your home, which is where we are now. Remember now, right now, we are like priests and kings in our own household. We have the ability through our knowledge to bring treasures out. That's a small scale. But one day, we'll sit on thrones, we'll reign with him, and those treasures will be for the nations. Wow. And having made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard a voice of many angels around the throne, living creatures and elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and a thousands of a thousand. Listen, God ain't running out of people to, and things to help him. John... John said, when I looked, all I know to tell you it was 10,000 times 10,000 times thousands times thousands, and all I know is just more than I could add. As far as I could see was angelic creatures and beings, and they all were doing what? Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and and such that are in the and all that are of them I heard saying blessing and honor and glory and power to him who sits on the and to the lamb forever Paul said listen to me every knee will bow every tongue will confess that he is king of kings and he is Lord of lords. All we celebrate at Christmas is the understanding of that. 
But I'm afraid most of you, when you think of Christmas, do not think of anything I just taught you. You can scarcely get past the manger scene and a little baby in a crib. And until you can see him for who he is, he is the king of all kings. And he is the Lord of all lords. He reigns. Yeah, but Brother Lot, all this chaos and what? He reigns. There are th a time coming when he will straighten and settle and fix all that's crooked. And you can smile when somebody says, man, this old world, and you can just smile and say, it's all right. My king will fix it. What do you mean your king will fix it? I'm glad you asked. Let me show you some scriptures about my king, who he is. Or otherwise, you're going to be like Ricky Bobby, and you'll be praying to baby Jesus. And it sounds funny, but we laugh at it because it hits us. We actually think a lot of that way. This, a lot of times, the one I just described is not the one we run to. But today, can I tell you, I don't care what your life's going through. There's a king. You have a king that's reigning over your life. I don't care what situations, I don't care what the doctor said. Can I tell you, there's a king reigning over your life. And right at this moment, he is in the midst, right by the Father, standing there in the throne room of heaven. He's listening to your prayers. They are like a smelling incense that goes before the Father. And today, if we understood who our king was, it would change the way we left here today and decided to live our life. Will you stand? I know it's kind of a weird Christmas messages. But it's no different than what the angels said that a savior was being born, a king was being born that the governments would rest upon his shoulders is what they said. But I don't think the shepherds understood it. I don't think Mary understood it. I don't think Joseph understood it. His disciples didn't understand it. Jesus even said when they were hanging him on a cross, forgive them, Lord because they don't know what they're doing. But the good news is, is that every one of you standing in this room today, you get to understand it. You get to understand it. That we just didn't have a baby born, or we just didn't have a savior, we didn't just... But a king came. And he's my king. The Lord came. And he's my Lord. A Savior came. And he's my Savior. And the only thing I can tell you today, the only thing that makes any of any importance is are you grass or are you wheat? Are you a, a fish that, yeah, that goes in the box. Or are you one that gets thrown on the bank? So you can't change that he's the king. You can't change what's coming. You can't change any of that. You can only decide which kingdom you live in. It's the only decision I had to make many, many years ago. Which kingdom 
I'm going to live in. I guess you figured out which one I chose. So this day, as I pray us out, with every head bowed, I'm not here to embarrass you or to trick you or to... I just came to tell you the truth. And if you're a scribe, if you are a learner, a grower, a disciple, and you decide to learn about the kingdom you allow that knowledge to enter into your life, then you can leave here today like a householder. So that if the doctor says, well, you got cancer, well, that's okay, doc. Because to be absent from the body is just to be present with my Lord. See, I'm a winner either way. See, that knowledge frees you from everything the world says will destroy you with. Yeah, but it's hard down here, but that's okay. One day God will settle it all out. One day he'll divide it all out. And everybody will get just what they deserved. I just hope everybody realizes it, gets their life right, before they get what God never intended to give them. But only because of their choice, he had to. If you're in this room today and you say, Pastor, I've got to move past just Jesus being this abstract, this baby, this person hanging on a cross, this, he is a king. He is the king. And today I want him to be my king. What do I need to do? Submit. Be obedient. The same thing the scriptures I just read to you. And today if you will say, Father, I will submit to you. Today I will follow you. Today I will live the rest of my life seeing you as the Lord and the King to come. Today I will follow you. If you can pray that in your heart and mean it, then that's all it requires. It's all it requires. Father, for that person right now in the sound of my voice that needs to make that step, it's time. They can't find their answer in this world. It's time. I thank you that today angels rejoice that someone has said in under their voice and someone has said to you right now, I accept you as my king. I accept what you did to purchase me. Your death, your resurrection, I I accept it. I am your property. I am part of your kingdom. As I follow you, do with me whatever brings you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.